This is the Andres Segovia Show. Greetings, everyone. It's Andres. Welcome to another episode of the program. Today, I got another local broker reacts episode for you. I'm going to be reacting to this documentary on Skid Row. This was published March 31st. And as I record this, it's only been just over 24 hours since this documentary was published by uh, Tyler Oliveira. I hope I pronounced your name right. But um, the premise of this documentary is the largest homelessness camp and most dangerous neighborhood in America. So Skid Row, uh, if you haven't heard of it, um, it is notoriously known for its uh, drug fueled and crime ridden streets. And I'm actually lifting that that quote here. It's just so embedded in my mind that even he uses it. With an estimated over 10,000 plus homeless people living on his 25 blocks of drug fueled and crime ridden streets and tents. Well, I didn't say tents. Um, referred to as a containment zone. How do these people end up here and what can be done to help get help them get out? Well, let's see what this is going to be about. But before we get rolling here, um, just a reminder that anything I think about me and links to anything I refer to here will always be available at www.thinkscope.com. So whenever the post goes up across the socials and across the, the video platforms within 24 hours, I usually post um, the show notes to it uh, once that's all made available. So just giving you a heads up about that. And anytime you purchase from any of uh, my affiliates, whether it be the Goat Farm or it be... Um, you know, Ranger Candy Coffee Company. I'm wearing their shirt today. Uh, whenever you purchase from them, even from TRX uh, training, that's like the fitness stuff, the, the, the gym stuff you can have at home. Um, well, that all helps. And what I use for streaming is StreamYard. So it helps keep the lights on. And I thank all of you that have uh, used the links whenever you purchased. Uh, even for those of you that haven't used my links but supported um, the small businesses, I really appreciate you all. Because I even uh, sometimes just plug in some of my friends. Um, they don't have any affiliate program whatsoever, but they're a small business. And especially being here in California, which is a lot harder uh, to conduct business. As of today, April 1st, um, the minimum wage law has changed and it's impacting a ton of small businesses. So whether people use my link or not, when they support local, when they support small business, as a small business owner myself, we really do appreciate it. So thank you. Anyway, I just wanted to get that out of the way. And now we're going to react to this thing here. So let me just put it on full screen for all of us. This is Skid Row, the largest homeless camp and most dangerous neighborhood in America, with an estimated 10,000 plus homeless people living on its 25 blocks of drug-fueled and crime-ridden streets and tents. But why are these homeless people so violent? How did they end up here in the first place? And what could be done to get them off the streets? So I brought my friend Kevin, a leading expert in homelessness and drug addiction, who showed me Portland, Oregon's drug epidemic two months ago. Skid Row has been around, I think, since about the 1920s. It's never really improved. LA is a tourist destination. Having all yep. these homeless has been kind of an inconvenience to them. So they're working on containing these homeless and really in a sense hiding them. So, you know, they're yeah. adding up fencing, they're doing sanctioned camping, they're restricting people from certain blocks. That, that's a good hundred people right there. Yeah. There definitely doesn't seem to be any order. Just drove by a guy using fentanyl behind us. Looked like he was maybe in his 70s. I suggest we stop and walk around and say hi to a few people. Alright, let's go into Skid Row, shall we? Alright, so I have stories of my own to share, okay? So I will interject them, but I want to mention that uh, he referred to this video about Oregon. So I'm interested in checking that out. And if you want to see me react live to that, uh, then let me know because I would love to share all this with you. Um, and when I say live, I actually do mean live because uh, I do tend to do live streams. Um, I just can't do them freely on YouTube. So uh, just letting you know that if I do a live like I did last week when I'm recording this, uh, I do that on Rumble and Twitter simultaneously so just giving you the heads up but i'm interested in checking that oregon video out and i'll let you know my own stories um be dealing in skid row friends of mine too uh and when i actually volunteered at some of the missions there to help some of the homeless some years ago so uh, i'll share that when we get to it this is why people don't go out here and do outreach is because of the fear. But someone has to come out here and do it. And immediately upon entering, we learned that everyone here hates cameras. I'm filming, homie. How you doing? Don't put the camera on me. No, we won't. He's out. He's out. You're good. You're good. We soon learned why. So are you smoking crack right now? Is that what that is? No, this is a uh, mess. And mid-conversation, some speeding gangsters with AR-15s zoom past us. What? This is uh, um, from uh, Mitch and Violet. 
Saw some guns. Oh, no, no, no. ARs in the back of the car. Yeah, we, we saw AR-15s. We're, we're going to walk out, guys. Really? Yeah. Talking AR-15s? Yeah. Yeah. Retreat, we just know the right talk. Saw AR-15s in the back of the car. Something going down a couple blocks away, and yes, it's good that we walked away. Well, there are a lot of gangs in the area, and we unfortunately encountered a gang. And then we stumbled upon this dude lighting a pipe. Hey there, how you guys doing? How you doing? What's up? Oh, what's up? Hey, Pasha, watch this. What's up? We're good, we're good. We're good, we're good. Hey, Pasha, watch this. We only meet good out here. Yeah, yeah. We're good to chat. The black leader pulled up on us and basically forced us to give him a twenty dollar protection fee. After we agreed, everything calmed down. My name is Jeremy Johnson. Jeremy Johnson. Yes, sir. Okay, you were just lighting up something. What was that? I just lighting up the day is a beautiful day. Yeah. People's out here is in in sheep clothes. It's like they night. Blah, blah, blah. They is not night. Who are those? Who are those people? Who? Them Who? is the demons. Is that us? Like her. She's she can, She got a sheep. She's she a she. She a human. She. How long you been homeless out here, brother? That's the demons, the blacks. Look at him. Look at him, y'all. All they do is cuss. Look at him. He's a demon. My boy, I don't know where you're from, but you look like a Herkaberry fan. When don't let him trick you with the cover. Okay, Jimmy Johnson. I saw you lighting something up. You not no good guy. No. He's the one. I'm a demon. It's fitting all out here, people. Fentanyl and just taking them down to the ground, and they would never come back. Tell me about fentanyl. Why am I a demon? Also, no, you he, got no he, demon. He's a demon. Okay, right. Tell me what it's like to be homeless out here. Is it relatively safe or not safe for people? It's not safe, folks. Don't come down here and get that meal ready to run now. It's scary. You don't hurt me, man. Don't hurt, don't hurt me, man. You're not gonna hurt him, right? We're good. No, we're good. He gonna do no, 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 we're good. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 we're good, we're good. All right, we're no demons. We're gonna let you have a good day, though. All right, thanks, Jeremy. All right, he's pissed. Sorry, bro. Okay. Okay, so let me interject here. Um, That whole thing about the cameras? Yeah, you guys learned the hard way. Um, A youth group from out of state would uh, used to stay with us every time they would come out, like around spring or summer to do a, a, an outreach program. And uh, they would take uh, different areas in which they would service sometimes, and they're traveling from very far away. So some, and these are high school students. They would sometimes go to Tijuana. Um, they would go to different areas of Los Angeles. One of them was Skid Row. So I did not go this day uh, with them. I was at work, but my brother did. So they went to Skid Row. They were trying to outreach to the people there. And one of my friends, was he had a camera and he was filming. It got really ugly, <clears throat> but I don't know how my buddy ended up. He's just so soft spoken, but I don't know how he talked himself out of that because everybody was calling him a fed. And it's like, let me say, he caught something on camera like you, you just saw here. It's it, it's pretty common there. So anybody that tries to do like a on the ground document like these guys are, Oh man, you, you're you're playing with fire, literally. Uh, these guys are lucky to have walked out of this thing because it, it gets it doesn't bode well for many people. That was quite the interaction. Yeah, they got a little weird. Five minutes in, the people in Skid Row seem to be way more aggressive and violent than the fentanyl users we saw in Portland, the zombified shrank users we saw in Kensington. As I, I wondered what the drug of choice was out here, I stumbled upon Raphael Leach. And what is this building right here? SRO, single room occupancy. Okay. And this is for homeless people to get off the streets and start living? Yes. And you used to be on the streets yourself? Yes, I used to be homeless. Off the streets now three years. That's awesome. Yeah. How how hard was it to get off the streets once you got there? It's not hard. It's not hard. No. It's That's a big misconception. Drug yeah. user is hard. Were, were you on drugs back then? No, I just smoked got a it. drink, you know, but that, they consider that a drug. Sure. Right? You know, but um, no. So there's money and aid and subsidies to get off the streets? Of course, yeah. yeah. If you want it, you... People, most, most of the people don't want it. And most of the people are drug addicts. If okay. you want something, you go get it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, if you want to fight to get off the streets, you're going to get off the street. But I wondered what resources were really out here to help these people get off the streets and stay sober. And I soon oh, found a sign advertising free Narcan, which is an opioid blocker to prevent you from dying due to an overdose. So you guys give out Narcan to anyone who asks for it? Yeah. Okay. But people generally are asking it for whenever we need it. Okay. That's nice. Uh, the reason that there's this many people here is because it's a resource heavy area. So if I was someone experiencing homelessness, I might go to somewhere where there's resources. Got it. 
got it. There's signs everywhere, Narcan here. So at least in that respect, they're trying. It seemed like the free Narcan, food, water, sobriety centers, and outreach workers ironically attract even more homeless people to come here. But do these people even want to get off the streets? This guy had an interesting opinion. I, I like the members of the white majority. The white majority? Yeah, you guys are members of the white majority. Oh, shoot, yeah. okay. Hi, you guys. My name is Paul Manuel Torres, and um, welcome to Skid Row. Okay, you like that we're members of the white majority. Yes. What does that mean? Um, well, so what it means is that um, I'm a minority, and I appreciate what you guys being the the, the biggest influence in in, 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 in in the country. You guys have built an amazing country. Okay. Yes. So what are you up to today, Juan? I just experienced a, a spider bite from a brown recluse. Okay. So what happened was is that um, I slept in some bushes one night. From what I saw in Kensington, this looked more like flesh decay from repeated use of Trank, a drug which is a combination of fentanyl and horse tranquilizer. So Juan, are you doing fentanyl out here? How you know? Yes, I fentanyl? am. But I'm quick to defend fentanyl. Okay, tell me about it. Why would well, you defend well, fentanyl? Yeah. Well, because, because I am a former IV user. And because of fentanyl, I no longer can inject heroin. And so I would rather smoke fentanyl than to inject heroin. Yeah. Why is that? Because injecting is something that should be done by professionals. I mean, it's it's, 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 it's ugly, like the way it looks. And also it's very dangerous. You can contract uh, uh, diseases and stuff. Yeah, so, um, so I'm grateful for heroin. I think China for having made it. Yes, there are there are many Americans who have lost their lives, but I think that when it, when it, when it was made, it was made in a way to where if you're smart about it and you smoke, you know, um, in small increments, you know, um, I believe that that it also um heals you and relieves you of certain you know uh, stressors. Got it. You don't think fentanyl's killing you? Uh, I, I do not think fentanyl. Do you have any thoughts? I would this, respectfully yeah. disagree. Okay. okay. I've had a lot of people I've witnessed die because of fentanyl. Yeah. I think fentanyl is the deadliest, worst thing I've ever seen in my life. And so I know how you think it's different because you don't have to inject. Fentanyl is killing people left and right. Yeah. So what? At the very least, I ask is don't encourage other people. To oh use. no, no. But this guy was the exception because the more we talked to people, it seemed like crack and meth were the most popular drugs out here, unlike fentanyl in Portland and Shrank in Kensington. Do you ever use fentanyl? No. Okay. I'm trying to stay woke. What do you use? Okay. How do you get out of here? Good question. If, if I had that remedy, I wouldn't be here. Is there violence out here? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, way quick plan. Yeah, you know, give five minutes, you finish something. She was right, as this dude got slapped in the face right behind us for no reason. One thing the city or the government could do to help. What just happened? He just slapped him in the face. You just got slapped. Are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. I mean, he, Jesus. For no reason. He just slapped you. Get that. <laughs> But it is. For no it reason, the guys got slapped in the face. It seemed like the predominant use of meth and crack was making these people so violent. And three minutes later, we experienced it firsthand. This is my friend Tyler. He was wanting to. Hey, hey, how you doing? No, 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 no. Oh, we're good, we're good. We're just talking. To well, Kevin tried to calm this guy down with money. This cracked out gangster called my cameraman a dumbass bleeper and said he would knock his ass out if he didn't delete the album. As this guy yep. began to follow us, threatening our lives. Let's not do this. Kevin thought our best option was for him to confront the guy and his gang alone, using his charisma to uh, defuse the situation. I disagreed, but he still went. Right now, that's exactly what my friend did. Uh, exactly that, dude. Uh, it, it's crazy. Um, and, and I should add to this that uh, Los Angeles doesn't care about dealing with the homeless. Um, there's this homeless industrial complex that's just getting so much money. Los Angeles alone has poured, oh my goodness, over the past few years, uh, I don't know, at least one point something billion dollars into this. Los Angeles, folks, it, it didn't, all they do is build housing, they say. So I've been saving this for an occasion like this. We received this. Oh, let me cover up some addresses here. This is from November 29th from the city of Los Angeles. Uh, this is letter of compliance, uh, ministerial transient, transit oriented communities, affordable housing incentive program. This was a hearing that was set because there's a, a community plan area of a specific plan within the downtown or just in the outskirts of downtown to build a supposed housing for these individuals. But what they're, some of these places are doing are uh, just basically giving them a more private area for them to shoot up um, and then they go back to the streets there they don't want a home and los angeles attempts to address homelessness is to just make them more comfortable in what they're doing they're not trying to treat the problem and you're starting to see it this is the, the crime the drug the drug fueled stuff 
I'll talk about Proposition 47 here in a moment, but let me just keep going because they also want to address the question, what can be done? How Kevin's with like four dudes. I'm not sure why. Sorry about the misunderstanding, brother. I don't know why he's doing that. There's actually no point to go up there and talk to four dudes like that. It was a little uncomfortable. Yep. They did invite me a into their tent. I, did, I respectfully declined because there was four of them yeah, just standing around me. I thought you were going to get killed, I'll be honest. Why don't, why don't we just run? The thing is, uh, we shook and we're now we're cool. Yeah, I guess. We'll see. Being so nice is going to get you killed one day. Is my theory. No, genuinely. You don't ever think you're going to get killed. Because when you go and approach those four dudes, I'm out. I'm already halfway down the block. So why do you think people are so angry and violent out here? Let's look at it in their shoes. You know, they're out here. They're languishing. They're thrown together. It's complete chaos. Eventually, if treated like an animal, you're going to start acting like one. Hey there. We say hello to each other. How you doing? How you doing? I'm trying to say hello to our fellow American uh, yeah. Japanese style. Hey, you're the nicest guy we've met today. You're the by far the friendliest person. So yeah, yeah, what are you up to today? Don't touch me, don't touch me. We can, uh -oh. we can cool all Well, I was just wondering because yeah, you shook hands. I know that we shook hands already. Let's it up. Everyone out here was insane. So we decided to briefly <laughs> go back to the car and call. Andy Bales, he runs the Union Gospel Mission, which is the largest nonprofit on Skid Row. Hey, um, I am in Skid Row for the next couple days doing some outreach out here with uh, my friend Tyler. Um, uh, why do I need to be careful? Speaker, speaker. Because people will flat out take your camera, pull a gun on you, rob you, attack you. Could happen. It's happened to my camera guys before. We've had guys say, if you don't tell your cameraman to put his camera away, we'll shoot you. After this conversation, Kevin was convinced that him <laughs> going back out alone would build more trust with these homeless people than all three of us together. And for whatever reason, I agreed. That is really good advice. And he basically just gave us a warning. Just tread carefully. Right now, we're going to send Kevin off into the wild. How you feeling? I'm pumped. This is what I'm good at. I can't wait. Do some one-on-one -on -one interviews with the homeless uh, Skid Row and just kind of learning the truth. This was the last time Kevin Dahlgren was ever seen. Okay, that's just... That's <laughs> if anything happens out there, who should I give what to? Uh, <laughs> that's terrible. Uh, give, give everything to my girlfriend. That's so nice of you. Yeah, because I love her. Hey, Kevin, you know the risk of your job, and I wish you the best of luck. Genuinely. Dog out. Oof. All right, hold on. What's the name of that guy that uh, thought he uh, he could communicate with bears? Uh, Werner Herzog did a, did a. Maybe some of you will know that this guy thought he he could talk to bears, be friendly with bears, because he kept doing it until one day, uh, no more. <laughs> All right, Kevin is officially in the wild. He has the phone. He's going to record. We're going to get some B-roll of the surroundings. With Kevin as a foot soldier in the trenches, we surveyed the periphery and waited on standby to rescue him if necessary. Do you just want to share with me what it's like to be homeless out here? To me, it seems like a man-made trap, really. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, this isn't a natural occurring area. I came here motivated. I don't even remember what I came out here thinking. I was, now, I'm like, if I think about it, I want to get off the streets. Where, where do I even sign up? I've been put in the hospital numerous times from violence. Yeah, two types of internal bleeding. It's like poisoned. It's a uh, real twisted out here, actually. But all these businesses shut down, yeah. boarded up, walled up. As dusk approached, we noticed more police around the area, and little did we know, Kevin was conducting his final solo interview. How long have you been homeless out here? I've been homeless here for, for a year. Barn some up. So what? They can suck it on a row. You were born on a set. My excuse is friendly. Yeah. You ain't got five votes. Wait, all the. With 20 minutes of no response from Kevin and him nowhere to be seen, I suspected he had been kidnapped by the gang leader we met earlier. So, out of desperation, I called him. Making sure Kevin is alive. Hey, you doing you doing good over there? Yeah, I'm kind of in a weird sketch situation. I gotta go right now. Of course. What? <laughs> uh, maybe let's let's peel in. See we find him. My fear of Kevin being kidnapped seemed to be the reality. As we drove circles around Skid Row, Kevin was still nowhere to be seen, and nightfall was approaching. If we couldn't find him by night, Kevin was as good as dead. There's walls. They're fencing people in. Also, you can see fences right here. Fences about to be put up. That is a crazy concept. And then, out of nowhere, we found Kevin. I see Kevin. He's right there on the corner. Lord, Kevin, what did we miss? This guy showed up out of nowhere, popped out of his tent, and he was holding a hatchet. And he was spinning it around, and he was kind of threatening me with it because he didn't know who I was. I offered him a soda, but he just wasn't having it. He says, I want to invite you into my tent. And I said, okay. <laughs> 
all of a sudden he turns to me and said, are you a cop? Ooh. And I'm like, no, I'm not a cop. He said, well, how do I believe you? I said, I guess I can't prove it. And he said, I know how you can prove it. So he pulled out a pipe. He lit the meth pipe. And he literally <laughs> shoved it towards my lips and said, I need you to inhale right now. And nobody else said a word. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. He said, well, that means you're a cop. And then he whistled to someone who came over and guarded the tent. And I'm like, well, look, just because I'm not choosing to smoke meth doesn't make me a cop. Right. And he said, then you need to smoke this. I said, I'm not going to do it. He kind of hit a pipe and blew it in my face. Basically touched my lips. I don't know. I don't think I'm high, but I certainly have a headache. Should we take you to the hospital? No, it's just meth. <laughs> so then I had the bright <laughs> idea. I could show him my latest media interview where I housed that family in Bend, Oregon. Smart. So I played it for him and that changed everything. They said, whoa, you're an outreach worker. You did good work. So all of a sudden they said, look, you're in our inner circle now. You're cool, but you need to leave now. And he said, you will guarantee to be assaulted out here. You will lose your wallet. You will be beaten up. You need to leave now. They weren't trying to scare me. They were warning me to not be there at night. He said, beatings and murders are so common. Oftentimes you just turn your back and next thing you know, there's a person on the ground dying. Someone jumps out of a tent. He described it and will just stab you with a knife and jump back into the tent. And Kevin, do you think we should go back there at night? <laughs> <laughs> what? I've done middle of the night outreach hundreds of times. This may be no different. This is just arguably the most violent place I've ever been to. It's inevitable we're going to see something tonight. But I was surprised to see that it was unusually empty out here with the occasional straggler on the streets, endless fencing, and the occasional scream. I mean, it's... Interesting. Several cops yep. patrolling the area, and one or two clusters of tents with people relatively tired or trying to sleep at the very least. There's something evil in the air. There's tons of activity, tents on left and right of us. Definitely some deals going on. But what is the solution to fix this hell on earth? I called the president of the largest nonprofit in Skid Row to find out. What What is the solution, uh, if any? How does this get solved? Interesting. So a friend of mine says people don't come to live on Skid Row, they come to die. Murders have gone up 47% in the last year. We need a FEMA-like response. Uh, we need for everybody who's on the streets who's willing to come in. And then we need immediate, innovative, affordable housing options like local homes don't get that FEMA-like response, what does the future of LA's homelessness crisis and Skid Row in particular look like? Well, six people dying today uh, from complications of homelessness, mostly overdose deaths in LA County. And six more will die tomorrow. We need to be humiliated by our collective failure to do something different. Also, go follow Kevin on Twitter at Kevin V. Dahlgren. Oh, was, was that it? Thank you, Tyler. That was uh, really good. I'm going to give a like here. Um, and here. Andy Bales, I believe I saw him interviewed by California Insider, which is a uh, no. Let me let this be a California Insider. Um, he was talking about a solution there, uh, similar to this, and just a disappointing response, if I recall correctly. If I find that interview, because YouTube was wiping out uh, California Insider's channels every so often, so they had to recreate one and recreate and recreate again. I'll, <clears throat> so if I find it, I'll post it over to the show notes the company's episode at www.thingscover.com. But that's all to say that solutions like that have been presented. So I will be leaving also linked the episode where I address um, the homelessness crisis and housing because they're, they're conjoined together. So I get what Andy Bells is saying, but uh, yeah, I think he also mentioned it. Los Angeles is not interested in doing that because the homelessness industrial complex doesn't even care about that. You'll hear constantly in the news talking about how we have a housing shortage. Do we now? We have thousands of units that have been authorized and approved because the state wanted it. And these, these commercial real estate developers have arrived, started erecting them everywhere. And these are luxury apartments, condos. They do nothing to affect the home sales price of single family homes and things like that. All it does is just you know, deal with the rental uh, market and the rental market hasn't even improved it the rental prices are out of control so what the heck is going on and when you have stuff like this like la's proposing again um one of the properties that uh, that i manage there's a 
uh, there's a structure next to it. I don't want to give too much details about it, but there's a structure next to it, and it's it's been there forever, uh, and it, it it was it was active. It's not like it was just a vacant building. So then to get calls from tenants to tell us that the the parking situation in the back uh, alleyway is out of control. That what you're talking about. When the owner drove by the property, he saw that the entire um, parking area that's a little like public space, but it belonged to the adjacent structure that we're talking about that I mentioned. All of that had been taken up by homeless. So the city installed these tiny homes all, all over there. And the cops or the fire department has to show up every now and then because there's usually a fire every other day. And they block access to to the, the rare access of the building where the majority of, of the parking is for the tenants. And it's awful that we can't do anything about it. Oh, even the tenants, they can't do anything about it. Uh, and then you get more of this stuff where they say they want to build more of this. And they're, they are building. They're building them everywhere. Look at the Cecil Hotel, what that's supposed to be. That, that hasn't resulted in anything, and it's facing Skid Row. I was at the, the Union Rescue Mission. No, no, no. I'm sorry. That's the other one. Uh, the Fred Jordan mission. I, I'm not even sure if it's still there. Um, but yeah, I remember handing out in and out burgers because they sponsored uh, the, the meals for that day and handing them to the homeless and just seeing a, a smile on people's faces whenever you help them. And, you know, it, it really hurts that um, you wish you could do more. But uh, when when you're a slave to uh, to drugs that you know anchor you and weigh you down, you know, it's you want to do something about that and you wish that you could but the city solution isn't to address the drug addiction it's to make them more comfortable to a, to be able to take them that's what that's what san francisco has been doing so here here's an area where you can use um your your stuff safely and security and we'll provide you the needles if you need them it's like how is that of any help so yeah there's a there's a big movement that's not helping here and california was proposition one is going to be pouring more money into this Billions have been spent. Uh, Gavin Newsom has been in public office since 2001, I think, and he's always he's going to be dealing with the homeless. Every time he tried to address it, he's left it worse than it, what it was before. Look at San Francisco, where he was the mayor of. Did he fix anything, or is it worse than before? Worse than before. And now with that two-term governor, he's making homeless worse even than before he came into office. So what has he done? Where the flip is all this money going? Seriously, where is all the money going? Look, I know the answer. It's all bureaucratic nonsense. And we have to create all these supposed new bureaucracies to study homelessness? What bull, man? Dude, Proposition HHH, another, look, I think it's a failure. A failure because it didn't do what it set out to do in the time it set out to do it. There's still a few years left in the things. Like, look, it's all, it's all bull, okay? You didn't help the people that was meant to help way back when when they needed it, and they're not even staying in those homes, and they've already destroyed it. Look at rent control that was supposed to limit homelessness, keep the rents down, and limit homelessness. Los Angeles and any other RSO-controlled um, uh, city, highest rents wherever you find them, and the highest rates of homelessness. And in the case of Los Angeles, it is the capital of all of it, including what you just saw from Tyler's documentary, the most violent of all encampments. We'll go on and on about this, but instead... Um, I did an update on this, a very lengthy stream that I did when I was doing a Rumble exclusive. So I'll be leaving that embedded in the show notes uh, for this episode of www But for those of you on video platforms such as YouTube or even watching this on, on X, um, the comment down below, I'll be adding this in a thread so you can see the other uh, content that I've done. But uh, Tyler, thank you so much for making this documentary. Kevin, thank you for what you do. It's crazy dangerous. But hey, um, mad respect. Mad respect. You reminded me of my everything you did in that video because your heart's there. That's what my friend did. That's what I'll leave it. Thank you so very much for watching this episode of The Andre Segovia Show. Remember to like, share, subscribe, stay in the know. Follow me across the socials at The Andre Segovia on Twitter slash X underscore Andre Segovia. If you notice, there's a P right there. That stands for Parlor because Parlor is back. So if you were on Parlor, you can try to reclaim your previous account if you still have access to your uh, email that you used to register back then and go to partner.com and try to see uh, when you'll be able to get in because right now it's invite only but it's working well and who knows maybe i'll do a video about it when um when the time permits and that you get a sneak peek as to how parlor is looking like right now anyway that's it thank you very much i'll see you on the next one